Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics, or welcome back. Nice to see you all here on the show. Uh, this is the fifth and already the last webinar of our third Crash Course series, which is on Big Tech. Um, and I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. Maybe you can say who you are, where you are based, uh, where you're from, and what brings you here to this Crash Course episode. My name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute TNI, uh, based in Amsterdam. And I'll be your host today, together with Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have uh, Jeremy Krollsmith, who is our web developer and designed our website, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl, and Jenny Pannenbecker, who is a communications officer at SOMO, and they're working very hard to make this webinar another success. So uh, before we jump into the matter, uh, let me briefly say something about Crash Course. Uh, so we, the five of us, are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we united at the start of the COVID crisis because we wanted to understand what's going on in the world with the crisis, how it changes our world, and also reflect on the challenges we're faced with. And of course, uh, discuss possible solutions. And that's where Crash Course uh, came about. So Crash Course is a platform which is designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic, and ecological justice. Um, in order to achieve that goal, we invite global experts from all over the world to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all so we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. And by um, doing this, we also want to democratize knowledge uh, and give you the necessary tools to change the world. Uh, also, because the topics we discuss are often quite complex, but very uh, important to understand if we want to change the world. And this time, we decided to discuss the challenges related to some of the big COVID winners, which are, amongst others, uh, the big tech companies or monopolies. Uh, and this is already the, the fifth episode on big tech. Uh, and also uh, the last one, so we're going to close this topic uh, this week. Um, and the idea is that in this hour, um, we always give you uh, insights into a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. Now, all of our uh, webinars, also from the first series, are published online on our website, which is crashcourseeconomics.org. And you can also find a podcast version and a summary of each webinar. And of course, of this episode, there will also be a recording podcast and summary. And on the former episodes, we already had Keen Birch, Sida Rikap, Farmacial, and Nandini Chami. Um, and our uh, next speaker will be briefly introduced. But first, Rodrigo, uh, please uh, let me hand over to you so you can tell us something about this series. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. So this is already the last episode of the, of the third series we've organized. Uh, in the first series, uh, just to recap, uh, we explored uh, the new role of central banks, uh, monetary policy in contemporary capitalism, uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And the second crisis was uh, about the unfolding debt crisis in the global south. And we asked uh, a number of speakers, um, so what is new this time and which structural elements have remained the same in the, in the debt series of debt crisis we've seen in the last 40 years. So in this third series, we have been looking at the winners uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's why we turn to a big tech, a digital monopolies, and their corporate power. Um, the COVID-19 period was a catalyst for the big techification of everything. The world was put on a, a tech diet, essentially. Uh, 2020 accelerated many developments that had started to take shape in the years before. Um, from a helping hand, uh, innovators, uh, and simply a power for good, uh, large technology firms, increasingly became ever, ever more dominant. And now we see a very small number of extremely powerful corporations. Um, these firms have amassed an unprecedented amount of financial firepower. Uh, this is affecting other economic sectors. Uh, they're venturing into banking, pharma, the automobile sector. Uh, it is also starving journalism uh, from advertisement income and has made a business model uh, from disinformation and surveillance. So to understand this complex cluster of issues, we organized uh, five episodes. Um, and throughout this series, we have been moving slowly towards, well, what we're 
discussing today, uh, these are policy options, uh, solutions, and, and basically how to fight back. The first two episodes uh, were dedicated uh, at taking a broader view uh, and to introduce key concepts such as platforms, rent, and intangible assets. Uh, King Birch introduced, for instance, the notion of techno-scientific capitalism. And Cecilia Ricap explained why intellectual monopolies are different from traditional monopolies and why it matters. Farvacial focused on the need for EU competition policy uh, and its limitations. Uh, last episode, we had uh, Nandini Chami, who provided a look at issues and solutions from the perspectives uh, of the Global South. Uh, so today we continue with sharpening our understanding of policy options, uh, real existing options, uh, at both at the scale of municipalities, uh, the national scale, and perhaps above. Sarah? Yeah, so um, to uh, keep you all uh, still uh, blindfolded before we introduce our speaker, let me just quickly say something uh, about the setup of today, because today's webinar is a bit different than usual one. It will be even more of a crash course because it will last only 45 minutes because our speaker has to catch a plane. So thank you so much already for, for being there and we'll make sure you will not miss your plane. Um, so we will have just a longer interview instead of a presentation. And uh, afterwards, as always, you will have the floor to ask questions to our speaker, which you can do through the special Q&A window, which you find uh, in the bottom of your screen during the webinar. Um, and we'll make a selection based on those questions. If you like a question, you can endorse it, favor it by putting the thumbs up, clicking on the thumb, and then uh, the most endorsed questions will pop up um, at the top of our screen and Rodrigo and I will read them out loud. So Rodrigo, we have the honor to introduce today's revolutionary speaker. Yes, uh, well, we are very happy to have with us today uh, Francesca Bria. Uh, she is the president of the Italian National Innovation Fund. She lectures at various universities and is a consultant to the United Nations uh, and the European Commission. Uh, previously, she directed DECODE, um, a project uh, that includes uh, the municipalities of uh, Barcelona and Amsterdam and the dozens of uh, organizations, and its aim is to develop uh, a public digital infrastructure. Uh, we will hear more about it later on, but uh, well, I would like to invite uh, Francesca Bria to, to join us. Hello, hi. It's great Good to be afternoon. here. Hello. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for making time and your very visual schedule, a busy schedule to, to, to be here with us uh, before uh, taking uh, taking your flight. Um, I didn't it's know not good. It's not good flying. for the environment. So, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but m maybe to start with a more uh, on a more personal note, um, could you explain what um, yeah, what the Italian National Innovation Fund is uh, and what its strategy is. Yes, absolutely. So last uh, January, uh, after um, ending my um, my job as Chief Technology Officer of the City of Barcelona, I moved, moved back to my country, my original country, which is Italy. I'm now based in Rome and I was uh, nominated by the um, Italian Treasury to uh, to chair the newly created National Innovation Fund, which is a 1.5 billion uh, fund to to basically foster the innovation ecosystem in Italy, which means invest in uh, new technology startups, um, but also create a network of accelerators uh, in Italy, technology transfers, so create better connection between academia, research centers, and, um, and companies small ones, but also big ones, public strategic companies, and try to basically um, uh, foster our capacity in the technology, innovation, and scientific space, um, given the fact that we need uh, to build uh, technology uh, made in Europe. At the moment, I think we very much lack this kind of capacity and we uh, we fear otherwise we're going to lose. I mean, we're going to really lag behind. And then uh, to do that in strategic sectors for the Italian economy. Uh, we invest really across the board from 
um, you know, green economy and circular economy to education, to uh, biotechnology, cybersecurity, uh, the next generation uh, mobility sector, uh, cities. So we, we have a very broad uh, mission. And is this also part of the uh, the project that uh, Draghi started with uh, European funds? Or well, this this started before then Draghi. Actually, yeah. this started uh, with the previous government. Obviously, now with the next generation EU, Italy has a as a very a, well. Italy has an important uh, part of that, which is the Italian National Recovery Plan, that as you know is the biggest in Europe. And uh, within the next generation EU, uh, Europe is going to invest. Um, uh, around 40% in the green transition and more than 20% in the digital transition. So obviously building this kind of uh, scientific technological capacity, but also invest in education, in talent, in skills, and make sure that uh, the digital uh, transition not only will create this capacity and will make our industrial sector more competitive, but that will generate as well less inequalities. So we are really also working on structural inequalities such as territorial ones, but also socioeconomic ones, gender uh, unbalances, which is huge, as you can imagine in the tech sector, and then you know try to spread this kind of basic knowledge and understanding of digital skills new competencies throughout society uh, and, so and just, i guess this is now a very big uh, very big task for all of and, europe and, and, and yeah and very briefly to come to the to the strategy um, is, is it is it like, does it operate like a revolving fund is it, it this is really loans? a venture capital fund, okay. so it has a long-term trajectory, and uh, we invest in equity, but also we invest indirectly, so through other funds and through accelerators and tech transfer uh, um, hubs. Okay, well, maybe we, can, we we get back to it when we discuss uh, Europe, well, your, your yeah. work, uh, Europe, or the work at yeah. the municipalities. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I'm very I'm very interested in, in in Italy and yeah, more of the peripheries of Europe and how they could yeah catch up. But yeah, because we are also talking about um, yeah big tech and big tech is yeah essentially concentrated in the U.S. and in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's not really that much in 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 in, in Europe to speak of. Um, mm. um, yeah, w w this is sort of the big question that hangs over perhaps the discussion that we kind of have is, is at, at what scale can 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 European countries or or Europe uh, best deal with that lack yeah. of of uh, of any yeah domestic e digital economy. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, I think we have to have the courage, the ambition, and also, um, well, the, po the policy direction to really believe uh, that Europe not only should catch up, to, should catch up to China or to the, to the US, but that Europe is in a position where um, it can advance a different digital uh, society. So an agenda for a digital society uh, that is really not, uh, as I say many times, not about the big tech uh, that we see mostly in Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley surveillance capitalism, where we have a very strong concentration of power in the hands of big tech companies, but also that is different from the big state that we see emerging in China, where, of course, there is a big industrial strategy, but uh, it resembles a lot uh, some kind of digital authoritarianism or any ways it doesn't really uh, fit with our um, with our uh, let's say, rules and principles and frameworks. And so I think we have to bet on the capacity of Europe to really build a what I call a big democracy as an alternative to big tech and big state, mm. which is on one side, of course, continuing to be the kind of super regulator of the digital age. And I think that we have proven in the past that we know how to do that. We know how to create, I think, a sort of constitution for the digital age uh, with specific set of rules that we can discuss in our conversation. But I think this is obviously not enough because if you do not have your own industrial capacity, so what I've been mm. calling and many in the debate, digital sovereignty, 
in the strategic uh, value chains of the future. I mean, this also will jeopardize our uh, ambition to become the first climate neutral continent in 2050, which is already hard enough. But also if we are living in an economy where uh, the market is basically shaped and dominated by big tech, and, and where big tech provides to the world the critical essential infrastructures of the future, which are underpinning essential services of society. If you are not able to create your own technological critical infrastructures on top of which you want to rethink the welfare state, you want to rethink education, uh, you want to rethink healthcare, uh, cities, um, strategies for climate and so on, and you're not able to control data, which is the raw material of our age, I would say, uh, then it's impossible to set the standards. And it's impossible, yeah. even if you have a very advanced regulation, like it is the case, for example, for the GDPR, which I think it has become a kind of digital privacy de facto the most advanced digital privacy legislation in the world, you don't have the capacity to enforce it because you know you basically have to ask the big tech of uh, Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and China to please enforce a model that is actually, uh, you know, that goes against the very core of the business model they're, they've built. Yeah. I mean, this, this means creating your own technological capacity, but even doing something more in technological and industrial capacity, because I think we have to be very clear in explaining that this is not only about the tech sector. Of course, I mentioned the welfare state, I mentioned the green transition, but I mean, these technologies are touching every sector of our societies. I mean, even the, the, the microprocessors crisis, the shortage crisis of microprocessors during the pandemic is hitting very hard. The automobile industry that is transforming now due to climate, to the climate crisis mm -hmm. and the climate emergency. So it is like this for literally every sector of the economy. But I want to say more than that, my expectation for Europe is to make it a question about democracy. I mean, meaning that this, uh, this European digital sovereignty should not be only about making sure that the incumbent industries of Europe can catch up, or even not only about mm -hmm. empowering our universities and startups and scaling them up, but it should really be about protecting uh, the fundamental rights of citizens, the right to privacy, the right to information self-determination, the right to digital sovereignty, which so in it's, it's a digital society is going to be key. And, and so making it a question of democracy, because, and I finish, and you can go to the, mm. to the next question, as we have seen, I mean, as we're seeing, um, the negative externality, as, as I said at the beginning, the problem is the business model of the digital platforms, which is based largely on the manipulation and monetization of personal information and data. And the negative externality of these business models are things like manipulation of elections, fake news, conspiracy theories, hate speech, and also, you know, really going at the very core of our, what it means, autonomy, in a kind of automation, in a machine age. So it is really about protecting the very foundation of our democracy. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that to unpack that, um, yeah, the, the very thorough answer that has, has uh, it's, it's very rich, many topics in there. Uh, yeah, basically advocating an, an alternative digital development model. Um, and maybe to unpack it, I, I would like to ask Sarah first to focus on issues of regulation. And then perhaps then afterwards we can focus more on uh, how we can achieve this digital sovereignty. Sarah? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to keep it short because there are indeed a lot of topics we still would like to discuss and the time is ticking. Um, but yeah, so I mean, regulation is also meant to protect democracy and democratic rights of citizens, right? So uh, we know uh, regardless uh, whether the EU has big tech firms uh, on its own ground or not, or uh, self-grown, uh, they're developing new rules to, to regulate big tech. And most importantly, I think, is the Digital Services Act, which we also, and the Digital Markets Act, which were also discussed in a previous webinar with Pharmacial. 
and she was quite critical um, about those regulations, specifically the Digital Markets Act, uh, arguing that uh, it doesn't address the fundamental structures and the entire nature of platforms, and also doesn't really solve the problems, which you already mentioned as well, related to data. So I was wondering, what is your view on uh, mm. the development of the current uh, regulations, yeah. so specifically the Digital mm-hmm. Markets Act? Mm-hmm. And is it is it actually apt to tackle the problems that big tech confronts of, with which you really well summarized? Mm. Yes. So as I said uh, before, I think we should think holistically and we should think politically and structurally. So obviously, regulation in itself, even if you take the entire framework. And I mean, just to say the entire framework, we only have drafts proposals. They have to be discussed in the parliament. Now we have, um, you know, we have the possibility to have a public debate, which I think, you know, public pressure and public debate awareness, let's say in society would help very much to improve this kind of regulations. But even if we take the entire and complete, uh, let's say, framework, which of course it has, as you said, the part of, of the Digital Market Act, the the Data Governance Act. We are maybe waiting for a data act to come. But also, let's don't forget that we have a part on uh, digital taxation, actually on minimum corporate tax and digital taxation. And also also that has to be disputed because obviously it is an historical, uh, I think, um, point. And it's very important that this is proposed by the new Biden administration. But obviously, we know we want it to be uh, more than 15 percent minimum corporate tax. We want to see what this means for the digital platforms. But anyways, making sure that we tackle the question that those corporations pay taxes where they uh, where they make a profit and where they have their users, which is actually where uh, they, they create a value uh, with our data. It is a very important part and also that they don't park their um profits into uh, tax havens, uh, which uh, uh, for Europe would mean that we are not able to have our own indigenous resources to invest in uh, education, in green infrastructures, in healthcare, and so on. So it is a fundamental part. And um, and then we also have to consider antitrust, which obviously uh, it is another very important point. And uh, we've seen that now the Biden administration has appointed um, Lina Khan to be leading uh, the FTC, which could uh, mean <laughs> that we have a person that is, uh, you know, at the kind of forefront of a new antitrust uh, movement, which obviously be very critical uh, with the role of big tech. For example, uh, the antitrust paradox, her paper describes very well what it means as a kind of structural uh, problem that big tech can own the digital infrastructure underpinning the marketplace and then through data and through algorithms uh, through flexible prices mechanism uh, discriminate competition. So it is it is actually a very uh, important issue. And I think that in Europe, it is slow, but it is getting there that, you know, the relationship between privacy, ownership and control, I would say data sovereignty and competition, it is, a, it is a very important issue. So now we see more and more getting, you know, privacy and cryptography, security experts joining debates with antitrust lawyers. I tell you that before this was absolutely impossible to think. I mean, I I agree with you that only through the lenses of competition, you do not grasp some of the structural issues that we're talking about. But I would say we are seeing um, some determination from Margaret Vestager in this particular space. I think she actually understands completely some of the threats that the business model are posing to society and to the economy and so on. So if we look at it uh, complete, I, I, I wouldn't be so negative. I think I think that as everything, as every legislation, even if you look now at the green transition, if you take, I don't know, anything that has related to uh, social issues or to taxes or whatever, of course, uh, improving that it's a matter of social struggles. It is a matter of uh, of societal debate. It is a matter of you know debate in the parliament. So I think we have to do that also with this kind of uh, regulation. Uh, but I wouldn't be negative. I think there are uh, this debate um, even now with the pandemic. But in the last uh, let's say maybe a couple of years, is at least very high in the agenda. 
So it is a political question. And of course, we should make it a political question. We shouldn't make it a question about antitrust or about just technology experts. But I mean, it is important that now these questions are debated as key political issues. And of course, we have to give it a, to give it a chance to improve them. And also, as I insist on this, generate proper debate on these kind of questions. But coming back, you know, I think that the only regulation, as I told you before, it is not enough. And in fact, you have to couple with regulation exactly the question of industrial policy on one side and then the question of possible alternatives that are more democratic, that even go beyond, you know, industry in itself, that, that go beyond market solutions as such. I think that digital technologies could empower genuine alternatives that uses this kind of strategic infrastructure such as data, connectivity and artificial intelligence to really foster an emancipatory uh, social model, you know, that's, for example, based on collective action, solidarity and, um, you know, lots of uh, different digital services that could be provided by a variety of actors in societies. They don't have to be only companies and startups. I think, I think, I think we also have to develop that kind of alternative. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Francesca. That's a very um, illuminating answer, and also I must say quite optimistic. Perhaps a <laughs> less, less this topic than many of, of our former speakers, but I also. I just want to make it a point, you know, to 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 show that you know, if we do not create the possibility for alternatives to emerge, which is actually on one side open a political space, a political space for organization, for debate, for you know, for. Um, a, yeah, for, for, for having these ideas to be in all le- present in all le- levels of uh, government and also outside government. And then we do need to experiment. I mean, I think that my work in Barcelona, actually, if it serves something, it's the idea that, yes, of course, I mean, uh, you do not want to claim that a city or even a network of rebel cities that put, you know, fundamental rights and citizen participation and data sovereignty and democratic control of technology at the very center, they can actually counter the power of big tech. I mean, given the fact that we are talking, I mean, we haven't discussed the kind of um, economic concentration of power yet, but if you want, I can and touch upon it and by saying that uh, it is absolutely uh, crazy how the big tech has, uh, you know, they have uh, increased their revenues during the pandemic of about one fifth, uh, reaching uh, over uh, one trillion uh, US dollars. Their market evaluation is reaching around eight to nine uh, trillion US dollars combined. And this is more than the entire uh, stock market evaluation, the entire European stock market <laughs> evaluation. So I mean, I mean, obviously, their um, uh, financial and economic and social power, it's absolutely impressive. And so, but but at the same time, so we said that, you know, we need to tax them, we need to do antitrust, we need to do our own industrial strategy. Uh, but at the same time, I think that experimenting alternatives, where we live, where citizens are, where communities can really get involved and democratically uh, participate, and also where we can foster an entire ecosystem based on open source technology, on privacy enhancing technologies, on new new economic models, I think is absolutely critical. And by doing that, we can show that my Let's say optimism is not just because I want to be optimistic, but because I think we have to show that alternatives can actually work. So we have to 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 go into action. We have to experiment at city level, at local level, at regional level, at national level, and and at, at pan-European and global level. So and I think and, that's and re- related related to your, your 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 extensive experience at the municipal level to bring about uh, a more democratic uh, development model. Uh, yeah. how, how would you say that the lessons at, from a municipal uh, scale can help yeah. us to, uh, well, to craft the type of industrial policy we need at the European level? Because industrial policy in Europe has a, has a very bad track record. Uh, in uh, in many ways, and 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 we need to have some form of industrial policy uh, at the national or European level. Not only, of course, for a big tech. Uh, and I, I agree with you. It you you cannot do only with regulation. You need to uh, you need to create your own 
yeah, alternative digital capabilities. Yeah. Uh, but if we are going to recreate the types of problems that already exist, then yeah, yeah we can do we, we can do without that. So yes. if you say there are real existing utopias, to, to put yeah. it that way, uh, how to to use those real existing utopias and, and, and yeah, move mm. them up? On the scale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even. Well, yes, they can be maybe pragmatic utopias in a way, but they have they are experiments. I mean, Barcelona City is continuing also under the leadership of Ada Colau, and is not the only city. There is a network of cities experimenting, and I think this is this is very good. I would reply with a couple of things. So I think firstly, uh, we do need made in Europe technologies. I mean, this is something really I've been uh, working on maybe the last fifteen years, even more, and unfortunately. Unfortunately, uh, we still uh, really, really need massive investments, which are, uh, first of all, public investments have to go there. And then, you know, parts of this infrastructure can be publicly run. Not everything. I don't I don't think we need to reproduce this kind of idea that it has to be all under public control. I think that parts of these infrastructures can be publicly controlled, but then also uh, we can make sure that, um, you know, we have specific rules, for instance, regarding uh, data, uh, mandating uh, about data sharing and data sovereignty and, you know, privacy and security and cryptography as a kind of uh, by default in these services. I think they, they could change the game. They could change the rules of the game, uh, mandating um, big platforms to share data for the public interest uh, as a Euro in a European level, at a European scale. Uh, it would be absolutely uh, critical because also, as you know, we need uh, data uh, to take any kind of public decisions. We have seen during the pandemic how bad we need public health care data, uh, we need mobility data, we need to measure climate change, we need to uh, plan our cities, we need to uh, measure what the impact on unemployment, the economy, uh, everything. So this data cannot be, uh, you know, a just a proprietary uh, rent of some uh, seven to ten uh, big tech companies in the world. I mean, it has to be there for the public good under democratic control. And this is uh, Firstly, what I, I say that the Barcelona model can teach us because we have actually done it. I mean, in a small scale, what we've done and even not too difficult, we've done two basic things. One thing was working with public procurement. I bet you, I mean, this would be the first thing for me to start in Europe, because now if you think about it, if you use the next generation EU, next generation EU will pour around 400 billions into digitalization let's say, if you are going to do these contracts in each member state to digitalize, let's say, schools, public education, healthcare, mobility, and, and many other things, and you're going to introduce clauses in these public procurement contracts. Now, today, for instance, we talk about introducing clauses regarding, you know, gender, uh, regarding women uh, employment or young people employment or even environmental standards. Why don't we also introduce uh, data sovereignty clauses? and also some other, you know, democratic technology clauses. Uh, if you introduce that, as we've done in Barcelona, you basically can uh, give back uh, this data to whoever is paying for this data, which is the taxpayers, and consider this data as a public infrastructure, as a public good. And then you can, of course, um, given the fact that you're going to protect the privacy and security and ethic by design of people, then you can open us up this data and give preferential access, for instance, to whatever NGOs, uh, small companies, citizens, um, journalists, uh, uh, and public administration to use it for the public interest. And then, you know, set the rules on the basis on which the big companies can actually access this data, because you have to understand that we are paying now three times for this data. We are paying uh, the survey, we're paying taxes <laughs> that would imply, you know, that then we get everything when we get the service. So also the added value of the service, which is actually data and intellectual property. And then we are also uh, paying the big tech for the service with our data and now even with money, because as you see, all these services are also asking us money. And then we are depending on them regarding artificial intelligence, because obviously the data feeds the artificial intelligence um, 
engines. And so we are basically paying three times and we are getting this kind of digital colonialism in turn. So these, these models can help and, it, and the public procurement, um, it's one example, but also developing projects like Decode, which are about, uh, uh, let's say Europe now wants to have a a European cloud, which is Gaia X. And the European cloud, of course, wants to say, okay, Europe can also have their own, I mean, we can have our own data infrastructure. It's a part of the industrial policy that we are uh, talking about. Uh, at least setting a standard for data interoperability, data security, and data sovereignty. Okay, there are problems there, but we can do that. Uh, well, we can also experiment decentralized distributed privacy announcing alternatives like we've done in Barcelona that are able to really shift the control of data to the people. So yeah, we've Jessica, said, if um, I, yeah, I may ask because yeah. uh, there's also a question from the audience there. And it was also a question from Nandini Chami, our former speaker, who actually also wanted to know about your experiences in Barcelona on the municipal level. Uh, is it possible to replicate also the successful experiences in Barcelona or is it very like locally bound those successes or are they re yeah. uh, also mm -hmm. uh, to be repeated in other places? And then there's a question from the audience from Thomas uh, Dolman who's asking, uh, yeah, can you say something about uh, the, the initiatives that you're most proud of and how were you able to accomplish them? Yeah, well, they are connected, these two. Um, maybe I start from what I'm more proud of, and then I say, can they scale? Can they be reproduced? Well, um, okay, I'm I'm a proud of three things. So the first one is having shifted this kind of debate and, and public policy about smart cities, because obviously it is very important to understand that these are questions that are very political, that you do not have to fall into technological solutionism. Uh, this is not about technology gadgets. And also this is about shaping the future of a city. And so you do not need to start with technology. So you can start with connectivity, data, blockchain, whatever. You need to start with a fundamental policy program and uh, challenges that you're facing, like affordable housing, um, fighting climate change, um, sustainable mobility, a better democracy, which of course is the DNA of the Barcelona experiment, because we wanted to really have citizens involved in shaping the policy agenda of the city. And only after you ask, how can technology, if governed in a democratic way, help us? to achieve those goals. I mean, this is a radical departure from the kind of smart city idea. And then um, we, we put maybe a couple of projects that I'm very proud of is the Decidim platform that enabled us to do a kind of hybrid uh, participatory democracy process in Barcelona, where we engage nearly a large scale amount of citizens in shaping uh, the Barcelona uh, municipal agenda, around 400 thousand citizens in total have participated. 70% of the proposals that became the action plan of the city of Barcelona came directly from citizens. And this platform is actually an example of the possibility of scaling and replicating. It is uh, built in Europe, made in Europe, made in Barcelona. Actually, it came from a project called Decode, where we've done a lot of research uh, across Europe. Um, it is open source. It has privacy, ethics, and security by design built into the code. It has a community that manages is the platform. It belongs to the citizens of Barcelona. And now it is used in 80, um, 80 cities around the world and more than 20 countries. And today the European Council and the European Parliament and the European Commission are using it for the Future of Europe experiment. So it is a, a, like a truly European platform that is now used as a participatory democracy platform by the European Union. I think this is a very big achievement. I mean, honestly, they could have been at this point using whatever whatever big tech products, but no, they're using a technology that is really different. It has different principles. It really cares about your rights and it can scale with the community. I think this is an example of what we can do. And then the Decode project, I mean, I think it was as a pioneering project regarding data sovereignty. We with this exception of data sovereignty is people sovereignty. It's not state sovereignty or data. It is really shifting the control of data to the citizens so they can decide what data they want to keep private with advanced cryptography, what data to share, with whom and on what terms. And these terms should be set in a democratic way using kind of cryptographic distributed ledger technology. I think this has been a, a, a test that has to scale. I mean, I bet it is going to scale in some way or another. I mean, actually, you know, unfortunately, I have to say, uh, who is scaling this is actually Apple. And I mean, in our view, uh, this doesn't have to be scaled by a 
by a tech giant. It has to be a democratic technology. So we have to scale it as kind of, um, you know, as society. We need these technologies as society. This is the point. So we need and democratic so states and a democratic EU. <laughs> <laughs> well, but of course, then, you know, coming to your question, how can they scale and how can they work? This is not a technological question, you know, because, yes, I can tell you, I mean, we have blueprints, we have tests, we have prototypes, we have methods. We also have a network of brilliant people. But the point is political. So in Barcelona, we had Ada Colau. She was running, I mean, she was the first female uh, mayor. She was running on a very democratic agenda and a social agenda. That's why it worked. Then yes, you can reproduce some of the stuff we've done. And of course we are actually creating some knowledge particularly about understanding uh, politically technology and understanding you know, how to put technology at the service of people and at the service of the ecological transition and at the service of whatever you know, are our pressing um, social and environmental issues, but the question on can it work, can it scale? I think it's a, it's a very political question. Um, yeah, we we have five minutes left before you have to leave uh, to run to catch your plane. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I, I'm afraid we do not have the time to answer the questions from uh, participants. Or should we try one more? Mm. If, if if you can summarize, for example, Angela Wiffer's question, because it's quite long, so... Yeah, uh, um, uh, Francesca, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, you can see yourself the question in the uh, Q&A tab. Uh, well, that avoids me chat. having... Uh, not, not the chat, no. but to the right, the Q&A. Mm. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm going to read it, uh, so uh, partly. Ah, uh, the Q&A, uh, yes. Oh my God, it, this is very, very, very long. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm gonna. Uh, essentially, it's about uh, is the Italian Innovation Fund co-financed by the European Commission? No, 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 no. It it's isn't. financed by the Italian state. I mean, it's, it's actually yeah. public and private. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe uh, because <laughs> we, we, we don't have much time left, I would like to ask you if, if just I'm gonna try to summarize the main message. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can correct me, please, if, if I'm wrong. But but, but essentially, you. you what, you, what you're saying is that we need um, well, th three pillars to advance. So one, uh, you have to regulate. And the, the regulation, uh, we know how to do it. It is, And it is a matter of how the political process will move forward in, in that uh, domain. But secondly, you need to fill the gap with your own digital infrastructure. And thirdly, you have to, that the way you, you fill that needs to be uh, we need to follow a model that is uh, democratic and, and, and very different from the existing digital models. Uh, so if, if we take that idea uh, and we move out of Europe and to perhaps areas that have in many ways less sovereignty and, and more difficulties in reaching sovereignty, monetary sovereignty, economic sovereignty, et cetera, like for instance um, in Africa or in uh, Latin America, uh, how, how how would this strategy um, mm. look in these areas? Yeah. No, well, I, I don't think, I, I think it is a question like monetary sovereignty. In fact, uh, this is the, the same type of question. Obviously, when we talk about technological sovereignty, we also talk about um, economic and political sovereignty in a geopolitical dimension. <laughs> so obviously, uh, these things are uh, very strongly related. I think that um, you know the, the question that we may pose. I mean, first of all, I think that uh, Europe should have that role. I mean, if you want a kind of non-online movement, <laughs> um, can be built. I mean, Europe uh, should uh, collaborate uh, when it comes to um, strengthening the relationship with Africa, strengthening the relationship with um, Latin America, and so on. But not in like kind of selling our technologies, but in this kind of approach of uh, you know collaborating on science and technology. I mean, for instance. I, I go very proud of the Horizon 2020, I mean, of our research and innovation uh, programs. You know, I think uh, 
uh, that not many uh, countries in the world have this kind of um, programs that are not uh, funded by militaries, by linked to military programs, but that they are like civic and that in fact strengthen the kind of collaboration between academia, uh, research centers, public administrations and companies. And I think that that would be a very powerful model where Europe could collaborate in this kind of research and innovation programs with countries like Africa and with regions like Africa and uh, Latin America. I mean, this was done in the past <laughs> and this can help fostering uh, digital sovereignty. I also think that, you know, a basic step could be implementing the GDPR and implementing it with the right technolo technological capacity and technologies. Because obviously, you know, if you go and see that the, G the GDPR is about like the cookie directive, click here and you don't understand anything and you're spending like 10 minutes to understand what your rights are, this is not correct. If the GDPR, I mean, beyond the regulation, which is very important because it protects our fundamental rights, but on top of that, give rise to an entire variety of privacy enhancing technologies that protect our rights by default in the way that the technology is built. Well, this would strengthen even more our rights. And this, is, this I think, is the kind of development that we have to make. And then on top of that, of course, it's, uh, it's about the broader economic and social model, where we want to go. And I mean, we have very big questions we haven't touched in, um, in our conversation, like, you know, the sharing economy. In Barcelona, we, we did a lot of work because we understood that algorithmic regulation was not just a question about technology. This is going to be fundamental. It's going to have a very strong impact about our labor rights. It's going to have an impact about um, collective bargaining and collective negotiation, protecting workers' rights. And it is more and more, I mean, it is more and more everywhere. So we're going to need to demand access to these algorithms and this data according to very precise uh, rules and very precise um, you know, type of regulation. And this has to happen to, to protect us. And same with the environment and so on. So I think, um, well, uh, those questions are going to be uh, very important. And those questions will help us to determine um, uh, what kind of uh, economic and social model. I mean, this technology has to serve a purpose, as I said before, if we think rethinking public health care, rethinking uh, public education, uh, rethinking, reimagining cities, the impact on labor, the impact on the economy, uh, even the impact on monetary sovereignty, as we as we know, because there is a very strong link. I mean, I'm sure you debated in the in the other uh, sessions as well. So uh, those questions are interrelated. And when you talk about reproducing this model across the world, I mean, this obvious, this has to take it, it be taken into account. And then uh, just very quickly about the smart cities. I think also at the city level, we can do a lot. And the smart city agenda doesn't have to be an agenda that is really about either you are there with Silicon Valley and so you're going to get all your city infrastructure. Actually, with the recovery plan, we, risk, we really risk to have a national infrastructure dominated by Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon on one side, or the Chinese equivalent that is not going to be a problem in Europe, maybe because now we have this kind of geopolitical um, take. But in many of these countries, this is going to be a problem. So the smart city can just be how you give your sovereignty to Huawei. And I don't think this is the right approach. I mean, you can obviously uh, deal with these companies. You can set the rules, but you have to be able to you know, determine your strategy, where you're going and the direction. Because technology should be there and the digital should help us to uh, attain more social and environmental sustainability. So, yes, again, we go back to the question that it has to be democracy first. It has to, um, you know, we, we have to understand what democratic control of technology and critical infrastructures mean. And then put at first, I think, participation of citizens because we are protecting the fundamental rights and autonomy of people. This we should never forget. So it is even beyond you know, economic policy and our industrial strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca. And uh, taking a look at the clock, I think it's also really time to wrap up. If you need to run <laughs> yes. now, you need to run now. I'm going to close in just two minutes. Uh, starting. Okay. Thank you so much for yeah, being thank here you. with us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. A lot of uh, food for thought also for the next series, perhaps. Right. Thank and you. Have a, a very, have, a very have, inspiring have a good talk. Flight. Thank you. Thank you. 
So uh, to all of you uh, who do not have to catch a flight, I'd also like to thank you for being here today again. Uh, and indeed, we witnessed a very inspiring talk. Um, and I hope we can also uh, discuss issues that Francesca raised in a future series. We will reflect upon this as a team, whether there will be uh, a next webinar series, and if so, uh, which topic we will uh, discuss. Uh, of course, as always, there's a recording uh, of this webinar, which will be put online on our website. There's also a podcast version, and there will be um, a summary and also some show notes uh, because Francesca did a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, we already linked to her decode project in the chat, but we'll also put it online. Um, what I also wanted to say is uh, we did a poll last time and we also uh, did a poll through the email asking you if you'd be interested in uh, participating in a um, platform uh, or a, a forum where you can talk to each other about topics that we discuss at Crash Course, because we noticed that a lot of people attending Crash Course said like, hey, there's too little time to ask all the questions and we'd like to discuss uh, some matters further amongst ourselves. So what came out of this poll is that, yes, you're interested in such a forum and your preference is to have a self-hosted forum on the Crash Course website. So that means if we will continue with another Crash Course series, uh, we will also work on a forum which you will find on our website. Um, very much in line with what Francesca just... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're, you're very yeah. much already, uh, uh, well, uh, democratized, radicalized, in the sense that we're going to build our own uh, alternatives, digital platforms where we can discuss how we want to shape our future together. Uh, hopefully also trying to avoid Zoom maybe next time. Let's see how that will go. Uh, but for now, yeah, so I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, what I'm going to do, last but not least, is uh, show you our website in a second. Um, so this is our lovely website, which is questcourse.economics.org. Uh, you can find uh, all series here, all webinars. Uh, a recording will also be put of this webinar on the website. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you can click here to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and if you're interested in participating in a possible next Crash Course series, I would really recommend you to uh, do that. So uh, I think this is it for now. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you will have a lovely day or morning or evening. And we really hope that you will stay tuned uh, because we're thinking of uh, trying to continue Crash Course because we noticed that there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm. Um, and I'd like to thank the team and Rodrigo and uh, hope to see you uh, at some point after the summer. Goodbye all.